Welcome to Australian Hiker, your online hiking resource. We're your hosts, Tim and Jill Savage. This is episode 144 of the Australian Hiker podcast. And in this week's episode, we talk about the Sydney-based Bondi to Manly Walk. While this walk has been able to be done for many, many years uh, by connecting a series of pre-existing walks, on the 8th of December 2019, it was officially opened as a standalone walk. This walk connects two of Australia's most famous beaches, Bondi and Manly, Uh, and uses a series of existing paths between those two beaches. This project involved a partnership between six local councils, the New South Wales Government and community support groups, and now uses a standardised trail marker uh, that directs you uh, through the series of walks. From my perspective, I'd been aware of this walk uh, and the existence of this walk for quite a while and just hadn't had, had an opportunity to go through and do it. And in all honesty, I'm really glad that I did. It provides some spectacular views of Sydney Harbour, uh, and not just the Opera House and the Sydney Harbour Bridge. It also takes you through a number of suburbs and bushland to provide quite a bit of variety over the course of the walk itself. To help you do this walk, there's quite a good set of online resources available, uh, including a website interactive map and mobile phone app, uh, which provides just about all the information you need to help get you through this walk itself. If you go to the show notes for episode 144 on the Australian Hiker website, I'll have a link to all these resources for you. The online website for this track provides a number of different alternatives and provides you with one, two, four and seven day options if you wish to do this uh, as a an end-to-end walk all in one go. Alternatively, you can go through and do this as a series of short day walks over a period of days, weeks, or even months. Really, it's it's a bit of a choose-your-own-adventure. For me, I planned on doing this walk as a two-day walk, which would have been 40 kilometres per day approximately, uh, but I ended up doing this as a three-day walk. Um, and that, uh, for fit Uh, and very active hikers is not a bad way to go, Uh, roughly around about 25, 27 kilometres per day. Uh, But really the choice is yours about how you go through and do this. In this following podcast, I'm going to go through and take you through my three-day trip, talking about my experience as a day-by-day thing, Uh, the infrastructure, including things such as signage, toilets and water availability, Uh, facilities such as food and accommodation, Uh, as well as my recommendations for things to consider when looking at doing this walk. From my perspective, this walk will go into our top 10 walks. It really was a great experience. And even though I did this as a three-day walk, doing it as a four or a five or even a six-day walk, um, depending on how much time you feel like doing, uh, it really is worthwhile uh, and Being in the centre of Sydney is a reasonably accessible sort of walk as well. We hope you enjoy. Before I actually talk about day one, I'll talk about actually getting to Sydney itself. I had the option of getting a lift up, but I didn't want to make Jill drive, do a three and a half hour drive up there, drop me off, then come and pick me up again. So I got a public... uh, public transport. I actually caught a bus uh, for, I think, the first time in probably about 30 years um, uh, to the centre of Sydney. Uh, I then went through and got a taxi uh, through to my accommodation in Manly itself. My accommodation choice was purely based on where was the closest hotel that I could find to the start of the walk, Uh, and that was actually a pub, Um, and in hindsight, probably not my best choice. Uh, It was a pub on Thursday night. Uh, The room was vibrating because of the noise of the music downstairs until just on 11 o'clock. So I had probably about an hour and a half of that, uh, and then it went dead quiet from there. 
Um, so if you are looking at getting somewhere close accommodation wise, I'd make other recommendations on that. And if you go to the, the written write up of this, uh, this podcast, I'll have some details and some recommendations on where I think you should go through and stay. So I got to Sydney on the Thursday night uh, uh, at around about uh, 8.30, got to my accommodation just after 9. I got up next day, which was a Friday for me, day one, uh, and went downstairs and had breakfast. Plenty of uh, places to eat breakfast in Manly. Um, most of them seem to open around about 6.30. So if you're planning on getting a 5.30 start uh, uh, on this walk, you probably need to bring your own food with you or expect to stop later in the morning uh, and have breakfast at some point. Now, before I go into the walk itself, I just want to talk a bit about the information and the resources that are available to undertake this walk. There is a Bondi to Manly uh, walk website, and, and as I said in the introduction, I'll go through and put all the details and where to find this in the written show notes on the Australian ICA website, uh, as well as there will be a written write-up of this podcast, uh, which will have the same information as well, inclu- including photos of my trip. The website is really well set up, um, so if you go through and just type in Bondi to Manly walk, you come up the website. Uh, and it has a number of very good features on it. It has an interactive map uh, that has 10 kilometer markers along the trail, so you can see where where things are. It includes uh, identification of where water is, so uh, where you can pick up water along the trail. Uh, it has a, a link to an app that will suit, uh, or a couple of apps that will suit either uh, Android or uh, Apple phones. And this app is really worthwhile downloading. I can't recommend strongly enough that that you need to download this app uh, because there are a few hard uh, decision points along the trail where you need to work out where you're going and sometimes the signage isn't as clear as it could be. And I'll talk about signage in a moment. But the app just makes it so easy. It tells you where you are um, and it, it really makes things much easier to work, uh, uh, work out what you're doing. Now, the first thing I'll go through and talk about is signage. And this is probably the weak point of this track as it stands at the moment. Now, in all fairness, the trail officially opened up in December 2019, so it hasn't been that long. Uh, it was a... Um, a collaboration between a number of local councils and, and state government and community groups. So, um, you know, the, the expenditure on these trails is being done as a, on a council-by-council council basis. Um, but the, th- the big thing for me that I'd like to see that would greatly improve this walk is really obvious trailhead signs. Uh, tracks like the Bibbleman Track, Larapinta Trail, uh, the Overland Track, uh, Canberra Centenary Trail, they all have very obvious track heads or trail heads. You come across these large sign uh, areas, uh, normally they have little roofs or little structures on them. Uh, they're, they, they, they're a very obvious feature within the landscape. They tell you what you're going to see over the duration of the walk, a bit about the history of the walk. Um, and this gives a bit of a, a sense of, um, of commencement and finishing, if you like. So I spent probably 15 minutes walking up and down Manly Beach on my first day trying to find uh, the very obvious trailhead sign that I was expecting. Now I had the app with me and I I could see myself moving up and down the beach on the app uh, and uh, when I got to the, the start point on the trail, there was just nothing there. I was expecting to say, okay, there should be a sign and there just wasn't. Uh, and I think with the, the start point and the finish point, they finish in the middle of the beaches. But as I said, there needs to be an obvious trailhead sign to say, Bondi to Manly Walk, here's the start, go for it. The signage along the trail is also a bit hit and miss. Um, different councils, and you can tell when you move into different council areas because they treat the signage a bit differently. Some of them, there'll be some large black circles with the the whale logo on it and some little directional arrows pointing to a B, which is Bondi, or an M, which is Manly. Um, and they, they are really helpful when you come across them. But they need to be repeated along the entire track. 
I think I, if I use an example of the Canberra Centenary Trail, the trail there's a trail mark with a little arrow on a fairly regular basis, particularly when there's key decision points. So turn here, go this direction. Uh, you know you can expect to see a marker in exactly the right spot. Uh, and these signs aren't always there. So this is where the app becomes more crucial. If you think, hang on a second, I'm not sure which way I'm supposed to be going, uh, or I think I've taken the wrong direction, which I did on a couple of occasions. I went off track a bit. Uh, I looked at the app, and sure enough, I'd gone 20 or 30 metres in the wrong direction, turn around, come back, and take the, the correct branch or the correct trail itself. So I think they still need to work a bit on the signage, uh, but this is probably my only criticism of this track so far, uh, and apart from that, everything is really good. The other comment I would make here is when you do come across the signage, it is really obvious that this track is meant to be done starting in Bondi and finishing in Manly. And that's fine, don't have an issue with that. Um, but it's, um, yeah, you'll find that uh, when I went through and took photos of the, uh, the, the big uh, logos, the circles on the footpath, it was, um, I had to sort of come around the other side and face the opposite direction to get them in looking correct, if you like. Otherwise, they're upside down. Not an issue, and I don't have a problem with that. But as I said, the track is designed to be done from Bondi to Manly. Now, the other, the other point of infrastructure I'd probably make here, there's two other critical things that people want to know, is toilets. I think the longest over the three-day trip that I had without seeing a toilet was probably an hour and a half. Uh, and that was in one of the bushland areas. Uh, and then on some other days, I had three toilets within about 400 metres, uh, you know, opposite ends of the beaches and then just as you went off the beach. So if you're concerned about locations of toilets, again, in most cases, you've got an hour and a half on one occasion, but in most opportunity, you know, most times, you really come across them on a fairly regular basis. Water's the other thing that people want to know about. Uh, I carried three litres of water with me at the start of each day. Um, and in most cases, I probably didn't need to worry about that because there was a, a water fountain on a fairly regular basis. So I could have actually, if I had have had a water bottle as an example, I could have filled the water bottle up probably about every hour and wouldn't have had too much problems with that. Again, it's when you're walking on the, the bushland headlands that it's handy to have a bit more water. Uh, and certainly for me on the first day, uh, after about probably um, a couple of hours, I was on to bush, and then I had about an hour or so, hour and a half in bushland, and that's when I'm, it was good to have the additional water. The other thing to look at, the, a bit off trail if you like, is things like uh, food and accommodation. Um, apart from taking snacks, you could pretty well rely on buying your lunches or your breakfasts or your dinners uh, through one of the suburbs as you pass. Providing you aren't actually going um, uh, and, you know, at 10 o'clock at night or something like that, you really can rely on the main meals uh, as you go in and out of the suburbs. Accommodation um, on this track is very variable. You have things like $30 backpackers all the way up to $300 accommodation. Um, I am too old to sleep in backpackers these days. I prefer my comfort. So I would go through and recommend um, a series of hotels along the track and which ones you use are going to depend on how you actually do this trip itself. The website for this does this in a couple of different ways and they actually uh, there's one of the options that will take you to a ferry terminal where you head back to Circular Quay each night. Um, and if that's what you want to do, that's certainly fine. Um, you can't tent on this trail you do need to stay in accommodation. Um, so you are going to have to pick accommodation choices somewhere along the line. And for me, I just picked reasonably priced hotels uh, along the direction. Um, and I'll go through and make some recommendations on the write-up of this um, about where I would suggest staying. And I came across a couple of very good options as far as hotels, so I'll put those down. Now let's talk about the trail experience itself. So day one, uh, I got up from my accommodation, went downstairs, had breakfast at 6.30, um, and I didn't actually end up walking till about 8.30 because by the time I finished breakfast, I went back upstairs again and discovered I'd locked myself out of my room. Uh, not my fault. Uh, the key, the electronic key decided it wasn't going to work. 
Uh, and by the time I managed to find somebody to help me out, that sort of delayed me by about 45 minutes. So not a good start to the walk, considering I was planning on doing this walk as a two-day walk, doing 40 kilometres a day. Once I did start off, uh, as I said, I tried to find what I thought was going to be a very obviously marked trailhead on the beach itself. Uh, eventually realised there wasn't one and headed off uh, south towards uh, uh, the, tra- the, the formal trail itself. So initially you're starting walk uh, the walk on the, the main promenade uh, just along the beach uh, and you are following the headlands around for most of this the three days. Uh, you are pretty much walking on, you've got water on your left and uh, infrastructure or um, shops or, uh, or houses on your right, but that does vary. So day one was spent pretty much with ocean on my left-hand side. One comment I would make before I sort of progress on from here is this is not the shortest distance between two points. Uh, if anything, it's probably how how can I make this trip as long as I possibly can to get from point A to point B. And as a result, you are following along with the headlands um, uh, and along the harbour for pretty much the entire trip. Uh, and in some cases, you end up doubling back on some sections uh, and forming loops. So you will have a, uh, have sections of this walk where you will actually come across um, uh, a, a trails where you walk up, you walk around a headland, you do a loop, you come back along the trail, you walk back out, and then you continue on from there. Day one was pretty good. Um, overall, I think I covered a distance of around about 27, 28 kilometres. And in all honesty, I'm not sure how big a distance I covered. I did actually have my uh, GPS with me, but I had it set on a 10-minute setting, which means every 10 minutes it draws a line from the first point to the second point. Uh, And given that I cover just over 500 metres every 10 minutes, uh, that cut an awful lot of space out. So I found that by the time I got to day three, I expected to take uh, until mid-afternoon to finish and finish much earlier than I'd actually planned. Now, the first half of the uh, day one is spent walking through Manly. So you're on North Head, you're walking uh, pretty much down through the suburbs, through bushland, uh, and you end up down on the most southern section of North Head, uh, in Sydney Harbour National Park, and then you loop back again uh, and um, come back in through Manly itself. You are in spending a lot of time in North Head Sanctuary, uh, and including going through old military infrastructure, so gun placements um, from the uh, from the World Wars, um, the old military facilities from World War Two, from memory. Uh, there's plenty there to go through and look at, and you are walking along through bushland itself. Back into Manly again, uh, and you're walking along headlands uh, with housing on your right-hand side. So you are going through uh, suburbs uh, once you get out of uh, the Sydney Harbour uh, National Park itself. You continue around North Harbour, um, passing through, uh, again, a number of suburbs. So you're going through Balgoa. Now, excuse my pronunciation here, I'm not a Sydney cider. And then Balgoa Heights. Going through a, another headland, which is uh, Dobroy Head, Dobroy Head. And continuing on through around the suburbs and the harbour. Through A lot of this time, as I said, is very much on the edge of the harbour itself. As you continue through, you end up um, at uh, one of the headlands, um, headland park, and you go out to Cobbler Beach. And this was one of these sections where you walk out along a trail, do a loop, and come back in along the trail itself. And I got there later in the afternoon, probably around about three o'clock, and I walked through a gate. Now, the gate uh, just off headland park actually said, This gate is locked. Uh, at this particular time, which means if you are coming south and heading through that area expecting to finish at 6 or 7 o'clock at night, you're likely to come across a locked gate. 
So if you are planning on doing nighttime hikes in this area, you need to be aware of those particular areas where the gates tend to uh, lock you out, if you like. Even though I sort of made the return back again, I didn't return back to exactly the same point, uh, so I didn't have to go back through that gate again. Uh, but I continued almost back to the start point and continued on towards uh, Chowder Bay. Now, this is where my finishing point was, uh, the Gunners Barracks, um, uh, down towards near Chowder Bay itself, around Clifton Gardens. Um, four o'clock in the afternoon, I decided it was time to call it quits, uh, and I got an Uber to my accommodation, um, which is actually in Cremorne is where I end up staying for the night. Now, as far as the day was concerned itself, the track uh, or the trail itself is very well set out. Um, I just had a period of a couple of days' rain before the start of this uh, walk, uh, and there was about 80 or 90 mils of rain, so the trail was quite wet. And I found myself having to step around large puddles uh, just by walking on the sandstone on the edge of the, the, the trail tread itself. In most cases, it was a really a well-formed track uh, and very easy to go through and follow. So, um, it, as I said, really the app is, is essential to do this walk and it's just handy just to be able to say, I think I'm supposed to be going this way, I'm not 100% sure. Um, and again, I suppose just another mention on signage here, there are some very small signs that are almost bits of tape with a tiny little black hiker on them that if, if you don't realise that's what they are, you, you, you tend to miss where you're supposed to be going. One thing I found on this walk, as I said, I was originally planning on doing this walk as a two-day walk. Um, usually at my full fitness, uh, doing two days of 40 kilometres in a row you know, is certainly physically demanding. There's no argument there. Uh, but I wouldn't have had any problem with it at all. But from a personal perspective, I'm not at my fittest at the moment. Uh, I'm currently at the heaviest I've ever been in my entire life. Uh, and I haven't done uh, a 20 or 30 kilometre walk uh, for about three months. So I found very quickly through the first day uh, that I was not going to finish this in two days. I pushed this back to a, by about mid to late morning on the first day, I'd made a decision that this was going to be a three day walk. The other mistake that I made on this walk, and again, it was purely because of the distances that I was doing. For me, I find that exercise dampens my appetite. I don't feel like eating, uh, and that's not uh, what most people happens to most people, but it does happen to a number of people. Uh, and I got to the stage around about lunchtime where I just ran out of energy. Now, what this meant was I ended up having about a 40 minutes lie, lie down on one of the benches, uh, eating a fair amount of food, and I, and I was really having to force myself to eat. Uh, and I was fine after that. I was much, much happier in the afternoon. This was a, a learning moment for me, uh, and it was something I haven't actually done to myself for probably around about three years. Um, but, uh, you know, I realised I, you know, I had to force myself to eat every half hour, even just small amounts, just to keep the energy and the, the, the sugar levels up to keep me going. I discovered by the end of the, the three days that the each individual day was very much a different sort of walk. So the first day, you're going through a lot of bushland on North Head. You are going through suburbs, but not spending a huge amount of time in the, in the, in the residential areas as such. I passed Spit Bridge again, which is part of the Manly to Spit Walk, which I'd done previously. Uh, and I, for the first time ever, saw the Spit Bridge open. Uh, they were raising it up to let some uh, boats through, uh, and that was really interesting. Um, and again, it was it was a a day of really enjoyable sort of a um, uh, walking through bushland. And the rain itself, even though it was annoying on the pathway and having to walk through puddles, it had created almost a, a series of not quite waterfalls, but you know areas along rock where water was dropping off the the, the rocks, which made a, a really enjoyable sort of walk. And I think out of the three days, that first day for me, apart from being overly tired, was really enjoyable. 
Wildlife uh, on the first day was pretty much restricted. And then probably, I think probably for the three days, uh, the, the first day was probably the biggest day where I'd seen wildlife, and that was things like bearded, ragged lizards, uh, not uncommon in this section of the trail, out sunning themselves. Uh, the bush turkeys uh, wandering around. And I find those guys really quite interesting. And I will say guys here because the big males in full colour and very obviously you know, they're large males, they just don't care that you're there. And I had one walked almost about 60 centimetres from me, totally ignoring I was there, just looking for food. The juveniles and the smaller females, they'd see you coming and they'd run ahead of you and trying to work out why you were chasing them. And it was just because they were running up the pathway you were heading on and you just couldn't get out of their way. And then they'd fly up onto a tree. And they're not particularly graceful flyers. They just seem to fly up into a branch to get out of your way and then come back down again. Um didn't see a lot of other wildlife on this trip, you know, the odd seagull here and there, um, but it was more, from my perspective, the vegetation uh, was really a, a, an excellent sort of thing, uh, and, and, and the views through to the harbour and through to Sydney were pretty spectacular. Day two, uh, I got a, an Uber back to the finish point from the day before, and then continued on my walk. Now, in hindsight, and again, this is often the way, you don't know until that you actually get to experience this, I would have actually finished off at Chowder Bay at the car park, and the park itself would have been the best choice to finish. That would have probably given me an extra half hour worth of, or 40 minutes worth of walking from the previous day. Um, because one of the things I had to take into account was because I was getting transport from the trail to the accommodation each night, I had to find somewhere easy for a taxi or an Uber to find where you were. So uh, again, the first day I picked somewhere really obvious, uh, but the Charter Bay Park would have been a much better choice uh, and would have just extended that first day a tiny bit more um, and uh, been a really obvious starting point for the next day. Walking down onto Charter Bay through old military infrastructure, uh, looked like old naval area uh, for, uh, that had been repurposed. Um, and this is when I discovered that had it have been rough sea conditions and high tide, I would have been likely to end up getting wet feet. And I'll show a, a photo through here where I had to just uh, work my way around the top of a, a sand area uh, and just avoid the water as it was going through. Pretty easy when the, the water conditions were nice and flat. But as I said, if the sea conditions are rough and choppy, you do need to be prepared to either make take an alternative route or to get wet feet to get where you, want, you plan on going. I continued on for a lot of the day walking through more bushland uh, and including walking past Taronga Zoo. Uh, and uh, again, there's another ferry terminal there, so this is a potential start and finish point if you want to do it in that manner. Um and almost ended up back uh, in Cremorne itself, which was where I ended up staying for the night. Now, the accommodation the second night was only around about a two and a half, three kilometre uh, Uber ride uh, away from the trail, but I didn't really feel like walking another two and a half kilometres on the end of my trip. But I could have done. So, walking through the second day. Now, the second day really was Sydney Day, I suppose, here. Um, in this case here, I'm walking past areas like Kirribilli uh, and walking past uh, Kirib uh, Admiralty House, uh, getting spectacular views of Sydney Harbour Bridge, of the Opera House of the city itself. Um, and I think for me, this is one of the things, even though this was um, a day more so spent walking through Sydney and, and, and city areas itself, uh, there are parts of Sydney, uh, I, I go up to Sydney probably two or three times a year and doing various things, and there are parts of Sydney that I'd never actually seen up close before. I'd never been to Admiralty House, I'd never been to uh, driven through Kirribilli uh, and a lot of those suburbs around through there. And even though I'd had family that used to live in Mossman a number of years ago, um, I'd never actually done a, a good drive through Mossman. So it was pretty interesting to see what was actually there. For me, it was also a day where, for the first time ever, I walked across Sydney Harbour Bridge. I'd never done that before in my life, and that was interesting. And there are a lot of people walking across Sydney Harbour, hundreds and hundreds of them. 
Um, again, for most of them, it seemed to be walking from north to south, but there were also a fair few people walking the other direction as well. Coming off the bridge, uh, you then end up in Circular Quay. Now, I do not like crowds. They tend to make me a bit agitated. I tend to avoid crowds where I can. And I came through Circular Quay on a Saturday morning um, when a large cruise ship was loading. Uh, now, these cruise ships are enormous. Uh, there would have been two, three, four thousand people lined up getting to getting ready to get onto this ship. Um, so as a result, Circular Quay, which is busy at the best of times, was jammed packed. So I, I moved my way through for Circular Quay as quickly as I could. Uh, normally I would have stopped a bit earlier, and, and even though I had lunch with me, I probably would have stopped and bought lunch, but I just needed to move there as, through as quickly as I could, and I ended up stopping for lunch just on the side of the Opera House where it was a bit quieter. Um, but yeah, Circular Quay was, <laughs> as I said, a lot of people, and you really are in the centre of the city by that stage. I did take the opportunity to buy um, some snacks and get a, a soft drink and an ice cream, and that's pretty much the, the choices you can make. And you could have very easily stopped there for lunch, uh, either before or after that area. Moving out of Circular Quay, uh, I ended up going through uh, and walking around the Royal Botanic Gardens area. And they were actually doing some work in this area. There, there's a, a, an opera that they're putting on, so they were setting up for that, and that actually sort of forced you to sort of move off the, the actual waterfront itself and take a higher trail. Um, uh, but again, a lot of people out walking around the gardens, having a look at seeing what was there. From there, uh, walking through Potts Point. Now, this is one of these rare occasions where you don't go out and back along a, a, a headland itself. This is one of the few points where you didn't go out and back to the end, and you bypassed that and then went out along uh, Darling Point uh, towards uh, uh, the end of the headland and then back out again. Through Double Bay, and Double Bay really <laughs> was amazing. I have never seen such amazing houses in my life. Uh, there, were, It was just, a, just so interesting walking past these Massive great houses, really well designed, spectacular views of the harbour, and you can see why uh, some of the pricing in Sydney is, is quite amazing. I then went out to Point Piper, uh, and again, you walk out, walk around Point Piper, and then walk back in again. So at this point, you are still walking along with the, uh, the harbour along the left-hand side, residential housing along the right-hand side, and you're pretty much following the harbour around that sort of point. Now, I ended up at this stage uh, finishing off in the suburb of Vaucluse at Nielsen Park. Um, it was around about five o'clock, so a slightly longer day today. And again, it just made an obvious finishing point uh, because it was a, a good Good, uh, very obvious location, large car park, toilet facilities, uh, so I knew a taxi or an Uber was going to be out find me quite easily. So accommodation on night two, I ended up going to a hotel that I could find. It was probably about four kilometres away, uh, so I ended up going back towards the Point Piper area and just picking something that had a good rating on one of the, uh, the websites online. Worked out well, a bit smaller accommodation than the night before, but still a good room. Uh, and close to um, uh, facilities like a supermarket or uh, uh, some, um, some good takeaways. And they're probably my criteria when looking for decent accommodation. Second day, roughly around about 28 kilometres, but I think this day was where my GPS setting really showed to be defective. Having it set at 10-minute intervals, uh, on a day, and I'll show uh, some pictures of this online, um, where you're walking in and out of little bays and around headlands, uh, I think I probably ended up doing probably closer to 35 kilometres on the second day. Um, and as a result of that, um, uh, it was a fairly long day for me, but I felt reasonably fit and comfortable doing that on that second day. Day three, 
Uh, I'd already had, I'd bought breakfast, so I had it in my room, uh, Uber back to my uh, Nielsen Park again, and on day three, it was raining. I, uh, I woke up during the middle of the night, heard rain and thought, ah, oh, that's good, it'll rain itself out during the night time. It kept on raining the next morning, and I thought, I'm going to have a day with lots of rain. So I got out of the Uber, I put my wet weather gear on, I went to uh, the front of the women's toilets because that was the, that was the only building I could find that had a, an overhang on it and just sat out the front of that, um, just going through and doing some social media. I, I, I was pretty lucky with the weather. I didn't get rained on in the, in the entire time during this walk, which was, wasn't what I expected. Now, this walk with day three... The best way I can describe this, you know, day one was very much bushland uh, and close in on the harbour. Day two was about the central harbour itself and walking through the city and the upmarket suburbs of Sydney. Day three was pretty much about the southern head and the headland uh, walking along the coastline. So very different three days experience. So starting from Nilsson Park, walking my way along through bushland with some suburbs on the right, but uh, harbour on the left. Uh, and then I got up to the very top of North Head itself, um, up to the Lightkeeper's Cottage uh, and the, the lighthouse on that part of the headland. And for me, I, I, I've got a heritage background and it really surprised me. I didn't realise that we had gun emplacements from the 1850s or because we were worried about French colonialism and the French invading us at some point. It was interesting to see gun placements from the mid-1800s and the history behind that. That section of the walk was, uh, it takes you out onto the, to the top of South Head there and you loop around and come back in on a trail. Uh, so this is another one where you're, you tend to repeat yourself uh, and then back out to a the the connection point at the, the beach just there uh, and then you're then walking your way south towards Bondi Beach. Now, as I said, I, I had actually expected to finish this walk probably around about 3, 3.30 on that uh, that final day, which was a Sunday, uh, and I ended up finishing it uh, around about a quarter past 11 because of the, the additional distances I didn't calculate from the first two days. The third day is also a much straighter walk as well. Um, you're not walking through lots of little bays and crags and headlands. So, you know, while you are changing direction, uh, and going in and out of suburbs occasionally because of where the houses are and the cliffs are, it's pretty much a straight walk. You're walking on the headland walk from uh, from the, 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 the lighthouse pretty much all the way down to Bondi itself. You've got, in most cases, good wide double-width uh, bitumen pathways, um, good infrastructure, good views over the ocean. Um, so it was a very different day compared to either of the two previous days. And, it, and as, as a result of that, it created that difference that it's nice to see. This was a part of Sydney that I'd never walked along. I'd never done these walks before uh, and was really quite impressed with them. I got this past Bondi Golf Course and then started making my way down towards the hill towards Bondi Beach itself. And again, there was good views of that and I'll have the photos of that along the website. As I said, I made it to Bondi Beach uh, at around about 11.15 and just as a bit of a bookend for the first uh, day, I was walking along the beach, I had the app in my hand on the phone, following along and I was getting to the point where it says this is the finish of the walk and expecting to find a large trailhead sign and nothing. And I realised the finishing point really along the promenade there is the centre of the beach which has a sign here saying Bondi Beach on it, um, and it's a warning sign rather than being anything uh, else. So um, again, from my perspective, I like having a, hey, you've finished this walk, here you are, it's all done, congratulations sort of thing. Uh, And that was what was lacking uh, at this end of the walk as well. Okay, that was my three-day walk on the 80-kilometre Bondi to Manly walk in Sydney, uh, taking in the the spectacular views of the ocean and Sydney harbour itself. 
I think for me, and I think I mentioned this in the in the podcast, and if you go through and read the written version of this podcast at the Australian Hiker website, this will go into our, one of our top 10 walks. Um, it's probably the best urban walk that I've done um, in Australia. Um, <laughs> best walk you've done. Yeah, I didn't yeah. get invited, but, you know. <laughs> and, and there are a couple of reasons for that. I mean... Um, I'll say that up front. I mean, firstly, you were planning to start a day before I was available, but also you were planning to do it in two days, which, you know, 80 kilometres, I thought, yeah, I can do 80 kilometres in two days. But really, I didn't didn't want to do it in two days. So the, the fact that you ended up doing um, three or two and a bit, uh, two, two and almost a half, um, I, I, I could have handled that. So... Um, I'm listening to this, the, the the description of what you saw and and um, the spectacular views, and I'm wondering why I wasn't there. <laughs> um, as as this is while we're talking on that, as Jill said, my original plan was to do this in two days, and and at my peak fitness, um, I certainly would have been able to manage it. And as it turned out, I probably could have ended up doing it in two days. Uh, because my final day was three hours and 45 minutes. So, you know, in hindsight, and it's always the way, uh, adding, if I had have started on time on the Friday, uh, walked an extra hour on the evening, uh, and then walked probably another hour and a half on the, uh, the, 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 the second day, I could have gone through and completed it. But I think for me, three days was a, a good way to do it. Um, you know, I didn't want to be doing a... Uh, a full three days or four days and, and then having to turn up to work the next day. I just like having that break at the end of the trip itself. Now, the website is quite good here. It gives you a number of different options. I mean, and it talks about uh, records as well or you can you can enter, enter your end-to-end times. And I think the fastest someone's been recorded having done it is 15 hours. And I think if you're a, if you're a long distance runner, now that's probably not unrealistic. But yeah, you probably are running it. You're not really uh, not really hiking it as such. Yeah, well, you're certainly not carrying very much. That's for sure. No, no. So, and I think the but it still would have been tough going because you know it's up and down and in and out and you know all around. It's not a straight run, is it? And there's there's also a lot of people on the track. So trying to get past people, uh, it would have been an interesting process. So you can choose to do this walk really in the timing that suits you. So for me, um, I while I do like having a bit of a dawdle and wandering through, I had a, a limited time period to do this uh, and three days was a good option for me. Um, but I could have very easily stopped and had a, a lunch at a restaurant and a cafe every day. I could have gone for a swim at the beach. I could have had a, a bit of a snooze on the grass. So I could have added a day in quite comfortably if that was the sort of thing that I wanted to do. I mean, I, I even could have gone fishing if that's what I was into. And speaking of fishermen, I had to dodge fishing rods a couple of times. Uh, this is something I didn't actually warn people about through the podcast. Um, people watch with fishermen up there because they swing their, their rods <laughs> to cast out and they don't tend to look behind them when they do it. So, yeah, I was uh, I was paying very close attention and almost getting hit with the rods as people were, were casting without, without warning. Um, I had expected to have a couple of days of reasonably solid rain because that was the, the forecast and uh, what, what the tropical rain depression was looking like it was doing, but it moved through a lot quicker than it, they originally expected. So by the first day, you know, the rain had finished overnight. Uh, I had a tiny bit of rain on the uh, the second day, uh, and, and as I said, I got through the entire hike without having rain. Rain itself wouldn't have been an issue as such, but it was nice to have cool weather, overcast, and also a bit of sun as well to provide a bit, bit of variety. I think from a weather perspective, you know, this is a walk you can do pretty much any time of the year, um, but what you probably do need to pay close attention to, if there's a big storm coming through and the sea conditions, uh, not so much in the harbour itself, but the sea conditions are a bit rough and choppy, and it's high tide, you may have to look for some alternative routes. You may have to go in through the suburbs to get around some of the beachheads. Uh, and there was one instance there at Chowder Bay where I went inland slightly, uh, only by about five or six metres, because walking around the beach, I would have had to take shoes off because I would have been sort of knee-deep in water. 
uh, and it was just easier to walk up over the headland, uh, which is what other people had, uh, had obviously been doing as well. Um, wildlife on this trail, you know, not the world's best wildlife track. You know, you're not going to see kangaroos and wallabies and all that sort of stuff. Well, it's in the middle um, of a city. It is know. the middle of a city. So, you know, good bird life, uh, black cockatoos, um, uh, the brush turkeys. And it's good when the males are destroying people's gardens, building these these great mounds to to attract the females. Um, they they really are quite destructive if they happen to be happen to choose your garden to pull their resourcing out of. Um, but uh, yeah, they're always present on the trail. Uh, the uh, bearded dragons are always there, um, and you know you get the odd little skinks and lizards, but not a huge amount of wildlife as such. But where this trail really stands out is the views. Um, as I said, I typically go up to Sydney two or three times a year, either to walk or to do other things. And this was an opportunity to see suburbs that I'd never seen before. Um, you know, in all my years going to Sydney and even walking through suburbs like Mossman, where I used to have an uncle that lived up there many years ago, uh, and he bought it when it was an outer suburb. Um, and I, there were parts of Mossman I'd just never seen before. You know, usually I used to drive to his house or, or be driven to his house as a child and you, know, you wouldn't pay attention, whereas walking through it, it's just, just spectacular. And some of the houses and some of the views from these houses are just amazing. So it was a good opportunity to see the city itself and it, and it is surprising how much bushland is actually in the city. So particularly for the first... Uh, uh, day and a half, you do have a lot of the headlands and the bush headlands you are walking through. Second half of the second day, you're walking through city area. Uh, and then the third day, you're pretty much walking, again, back on the coastal area, but you're walking on coastal paths, but it's pretty much uh, on the edge of suburbia. So it was three very different days. The second day did surprise me. And as I mentioned, I had my my uh, GPS set on a fairly coarse setting, which means it wasn't giving me an accurate reading. And I thought I'd only done around about 28 kilometres, but I think I worked it out that I'd done about 35. Uh, the timing, so I couldn't work out why it was taking me so long to, <laughs> to walk that is only 28 kilometres. And when I actually looked at it on the map, I thought, no, that makes sense. Um, so it was just, you were just weaving your way out of these little bays and it was in and out, in and out. And, uh, because I've, I, was, I was walking roughly about 500 metres every 10 minutes, um, which is what my GPS was recording, it was drawing these little straight lines across the bays. So uh, lesson learned. Um, I'd, I'd had it set like that for some very much longer hikes, uh, and I realised that, you know, particularly for the shorter hikes, uh, an 80 kilometres is, is a relatively short hike uh, as such. I need to have it set on a much finer uh, recording setting. Mm. Yeah, well, it's interesting, isn't it? We we we've been uh, caught before with the GPS um, in terms of going up and down, um, but going in and out—that's another you know thing that uh, people need to think about. Altitude-wise, you do have hills that you are walking up and down, but they're not mountains. Um, you know, yes, they are are going to push you, particularly if you're carrying a heavier pack. Uh, but in most cases, it's not an overly strenuous, you know, you're not walking up 500 metres to get up to the top of a hill and having to come back down again. Um, and if you have a look at the altitude settings, pretty much it was sea level two. I think it was about 82 metres from memory was the highest altitude that I had. And, you know, on the first day in particular, not a huge change and not a huge number of hills. So um, it it's, as I said, this is a really, really spectacular walk. It's um, I can't recommend it highly enough, and I think it's going to, uh, uh, as people become aware of it, um, uh, it's going to be done more and more, uh, particularly if you want a walk where you don't have to go bush, but you get a chance to be in the bush. Uh, you can. It's almost a bit like glamping, where you can go and stay in a, in a hotel uh, you can stay in a three hundred dollar a night hotel if you want, or a, a thirty dollar backpackers, uh, and anywhere in between. So I think you know, choose your own level of accommodation and, and expense. Uh, that really is up to you and how you go on that. So if you want more information on this walk, 
go to the write-up of this uh, trail uh, in the trail section of our website at www.australianhiker.com.au and we'll have all the images uh, as well to show you what I was seeing over that three-day period. One final comment I would make here is I have hiked in, in the Sydney area before, uh, having done the Manly to Spit walk a few years ago. Um, this walk has really just enthused me to do some of the other longer distance walks in the Sydney area, uh, and I have some of those planned uh, over the remainder of this year, and I'll probably be into next year as well, because there's quite a few uh, walks of similar or longer and shorter lengths uh, that are available. So we'll hope to be, be visiting that area a bit more often later in the year. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. That's all for me. Bye for now. And bye from me.